So good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, spine education s seminar here at Manhattan Orthopedic Spine. And our topic today that we'll be discussing will be lumbar microdiscectomy. As a piece that will help us kind of discuss uh, this topic today, we're going to actually use a representative patient of this type of uh, uh, abnormality that presents to our practice quite common. So today we're going to be talking about uh, initials JS, who's a 47-year-old male with uh, back and leg pain for about three months duration. He really comes in with presenting with more leg pain than back pain. His severity ranges from a constant minimum 4 out of 10 pain and can actually escalate up to 8 out of 10. His uh, pain uh, is episodic and unpredictable, and it's worse at night when he tries to sleep. His pain is significantly affecting his quality of life. It's affecting his concentration at office and his interaction with his uh, family at home and with coworkers. He's concerned and admittedly fearful of any new movement that may bring on the severe symptoms. Non-operative treatment is, is, has included three months of physical therapy, daily flexibility sessions at home, epidural steroid injections, and breathing exercises to help manage the pain. When he came into the office, he, he did, uh, in his most recent visit, he was pleased to report that the combination of uh, some breathing exercises that he's been practicing daily home flexibility se sessions have given him some added confidence regarding his, uh, his movement and helped control his pain. However, he feels he has given his body a chance to heal and he wishes to discuss some surgical options. Here on this slide we can see um, depictions of his uh, MRI. On the left we can appreciate at the top what's uh, referred to as uh, and looks as a normal disc which is uh, fluid filled. The bulging disc just underneath that is representative more of a degenerative process and in this case this last disc this is represented by this herniation which on the right side we see as a indentation and pushing of the nerve roots. The nerve roots are the what comes out as a white signal here as opposed to the darker gray is the uh, disc fragment that we can see. So as the patient stated, having given his body a chance to heal and all these different uh, modifications of behavior and activity, including three months of, uh, of rest, physical therapy, epidural steroid injections, trial of anti-inflammatory medication, and daily stretching and traction exercises and breathing techniques, he comes to our office asking, what are my surgical options? And that brings us to the topic of uh, today's education seminar, lumbar micros microscopic uh, discectomy. Open discectomy is the most common surgical treatment for ruptured or herniated discs of the lumbar spine. When the outer wall of a disc, which is named the annulus fibrosis, becomes weakened, it may tear, allowing the soft inner part of the disc, the nucleus pulposus, to push its way out. This is what is referred to as a disc herniation, disc prolapse, or a slipped or bulging disc, which we can he see here on these slides with the indentation of the nerve root. Once the inner disc material extends out past the regular margin of the outer disc wall, it can press up against very sensitive nerve tissue in the spine. This disc material can compress or even damage the nerve tissue, and this can cause weakness, tingling, or pain in the low back, or it can radiate into one or both legs, often referred to as sciatica. Open discectomy uses surgery to remove part of the damaged disc and thus to relieve the pressure on the nerve tissue 
and alleviate the pain. The surgery involves a small incision that we make over the lower back, removal of some of the ligament and bone material to access the disc and removal of some of this disc material that's causing pressure. So who is a candidate for open discectomy? Fortunately, not all patients with herniated discs end up being candidates for open surgery. Most people find relief with non-surgical means such as rest, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, and or epidural injections. However, sometimes the pain does not respond to these therapies and may require a more aggressive intervention. One of the unique features here at uh, Manhattan Orthopedic Spine is really exploring to what degree the connective tissue that's above the actual spinal ligaments, the discs, and the bones can be causes of the actual pain. So our muscles, ligaments, tendons often can chronically be over tightened and with a consistent daily treatment to these uh, connective tissue, uh, we can gain some flexibility, which actually leads to um, decreased pain. What type of workup do we do here in the office for this type of presentation that we saw in, uh, in our model patient, JS? If the back and leg pain does not respond to some of the non-surgical treatment, and continues for four to six weeks or longer, we would start with getting some plain x-rays and usually supplement it with something like an MRI, which is a test that allows us to get a much better understanding of the soft tissues of the spine. If a diagnosis of herniated disc is confirmed and has failed the non-operative treatment, that's when the open discectomy may become an option. One other feature that's a little different from the open discectomy that I wanted to talk about today a little bit is the endoscopic microdiscectomy. This utilizes a camera similar to other terms that we're familiar with, arthroscopic or laparoscopic, where surgical treatment is performed using small uh, tubular retractors that allow for direct visualization with a camera minimizes the trauma to the surrounding tissues. This is something that we utilize here um, for our patients. However, it is a subspecialized group of patients that are really best suited uh, for this much less invasive um, discectomy. Open discectomy is usually performed under general anesthesia where the patient is unconscious and typically requires one day of hospital stay. It's performed while the patient is in a lying down position on your belly. During, the, uh, during that, the procedure, we make approximately about a one inch uh, incision over the low back. The muscle tissue is removed from the bone above and below the affected um, disc and allows for a clear view of the disc that is herniated. In some cases, the bone and ligaments may have to be removed to have a better visualization, but at the same time not causing any type of instability to the spine. This is referred to as a laminectomy or a laminotomy. Once we're able to visualize the lamina, which is the posterior, the bony structure uh, above the spinal nerves, the disc is visualized and the nerve roots are protected while we remove the disc fragment that's causing the pressure. This is usually done where, under magnification where we could use either a microscope or loop ma magnification um, uh, glasses that we use in the operating room. Once the disc tissue, disc tissue is removed, the incision is closed with sutures and usually this will recommend a uh, overnight stay uh, in the hospital. After this procedure, 
oftentimes you will uh, feel pain at the site of the incision, which is, uh, which is expected. And there are times where the original pain may not be completely relieved immediately after the surgery as the pressure from the disc that's been applied on the nerve takes sometimes some days or weeks before the nerve can, uh, um, can even feel that it's not under pressure anymore. Oftentimes one of the best exercises uh, after this type of procedure is really walking. What we aim for is by six weeks after the surgery being able to ambulate pain free for a mile without stopping. Sometimes physical therapy is, uh, is necessary, but often that would uh, only begin at the six week mark at the earliest, if it's even indicated. At home, after this procedure, you might have some uh, minor restrictions, such as not sitting for long periods of time, lifting objects more than five pounds, or ex excessive bending or stretching uh, for those first four to six weeks. Returning to work. Most people with uh, jobs that aren't too physically uh, challenging can return to work in two to four weeks or less. Those with jobs that require heavy lifting or operating machinery that cause uh, intense vibration may need to wait longer than the, the normal six to eight weeks. In a minute, we'll uh, open it up to any type of questions that, uh, that you may have concerning this topic of uh, lumbar open microdiscectomy. Also, we'll uh, have a handout with these type of resources that you see here on the slide of some further information that uh, you can look into that uh, goes a little more in depth to the topic that we discussed uh, today. That's a great question. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is a very subspecialized group of patients that have a disc herniation without not, without a lot of bone spurs in and around and near that disc herniation um, because at this time still the gold standard would be more of an open procedure. So in terms of numbers, I would say it's well under 10% of disc herniations that we see here in the office would even be potential candidates and of that 10, maybe even half of those actually go under an un endoscopic procedure. So both patients and surgeons are much more satisfied with minimally invasive uh, techniques, uh, which we employ here uh, in our practice readily. The first and foremost of any type of procedure, it has to be the safest procedure. And often with, with for spine surgery, the safest often means visualizing and protecting the surrounding neural structures, which still requires an open procedure. With that said, most of the open procedures that we do are made through a relatively small incision. When I say small, meaning an inch, inch and a half, to still be able to visualize and protect the neural structures and to take care of uh, the pressure that's on the nerve without destabilizing the spine and without injuring too much of the muscle in and around. So those still fall under a minimally invasive approach to treating the spine. Um, that term is used quite liberally in terms of what minimally invasive and I think that's what causes a lot of the confusion. Correct, correct. but. Uh, if uh, the way I always present it to my patients, if this was my, my spine or anybody in my family, clearly I want to make sure you're being able to see and do what you need to do. And oftentimes that gold standard still means an open procedure. As I mentioned about what's, what's a great unique feature about the endoscopic is that that technology didn't have a camera that we could actually see the structures at the same time. So clearly that's, uh, it's, a, it's an area that's still developing it within spine surgery and something that's really, you know, that, uh, that we look to continue to employ um, for, for our patients uh, w with those very specific indications.